Hello, and this is our week six of our digital game design class. My name is Doug Teppi, and I'm with Tinker and Create. Tonight, we are going to be going over uh, handling variables and adding in a couple other gameplay functionalities, such as splines and the like, so we can have more moving platforms. And uh, we're going to try and see if we can tighten up the game over event a little bit better, too. Right now, uh, it is just popping up with this sign that says that it's a game over and then it starts all over again. But I think it'd be more fun, of course, if we actually had, an, say, an explosion or something. And uh, there are ways to make it a little bit better and we'll see how we get to that. Um, first things first, anyways, um, for those of you who are just joining us, again, my name is Doug Teppi and I'm with Tinker and Create. This is the sixth class on digital game design. And what we're going to cover tonight, starting off, is going to be variables. Now, variables are something that maybe you haven't actually learned at school yet, depending on how old you are. But a variables is a concept from math and algebra. And you'll see it appearing right up here. And uh, so these are what we call variables in terms of math and algebra. A variable usually can just be represented by a letter. Um, and in terms of computer programming and game design, we don't like to just use letters. We actually use to have, like to use a full name to describe our variables. But the best way to think of a variable is, is a box where you store all of the information you need to use later. And we've already used variables a couple times already through our game design here. Uh, particularly the first one that comes to mind was every single time we check to see whether or not we're using the third person character and we would cast the third person character, the casting itself is actually locking the third person character into a variable. So that way we can use it later, reach inside it, pull out all the data that we need out of it. So it is a very handy way to get more information later. Uh, the other thing you're going to notice about this little picture I included here, too, is it also mentions constants. You might remember, too, about how we were talking about constants when we were doing some design for our uh, materials, the lava that we included and everything. Um, so in that case, of course, a constant just means it's never changing. In the case of algebra here, a constant is just a straight up number. It is going to be that number. But in the case of the variable, it might be something different depending on when we use it and how we use it. Um, and that's the same thing, of course, that also occurs in game design. So let's go and have a look-see here. I'm going to bring up my game. And so looking at this, what we did last week was is that we included the gameplay element of the game over. So when we actually step on the lava, it says you lose. Pops up with our little heads up display there if you mistakenly step into the lava. So this, of course, is what I was talking about in terms of tightening it up. Right now, we can still keep on running right across it. And likewise, too, there's really no way to see if someone's actually winning the game or not. How do they win the game? Well, in the case of a running game, usually it's set as a timer or perhaps how many coins you can pick up. Uh, I think what we're gonna do is actually use a timer. So right now, our current game over event doesn't actually allow for us to set a timer because it actually restarts the level every single time we go back. You might remember when we have the game over event um, begin, it opens up the level again, which is very handy, but it actually restarts everything, including timers. And we might want to actually use timers later to actually keep track of how we win the game. Uh, so. Let's see if we can start with variables. The best way to do it is to actually go over here to our launch pad. So you might recall with our launch pad, we created it the other week as we go running along. We go down to the end of the corridor here. You can see the spinners up on top there. As soon as we touch the launch pad, it bounces us up in the air lands over on the other side. What if we wanted to use the launch pad in some more way than just that? Right now, we would actually have to go straight into our launch pad blueprint 
to make any changes we want to make with it. So I can click on this here. I look over in my world outliner on the right side of the screen, click on edit launch pad. We can see in here where it says on component hit. When I hit the pad, we launch the character. And it says that the launch velocity is 1400 straight up in the air. But that's pretty limiting. What if I actually wanted to have a situation where, for example, we want the character to get bounced forward and then to the side, maybe causing a situation where they end up going into some sort of secret hidden area or something like that. And so I'm going to want to have different launch pads that do different things at different times. The way I do that is with a variable. So right now, as you can see, with the launch velocity here, it's got this little yellow node uh, that I can plug in new things off of the side here. So I could actually stick a variable in there that actually gives it all of its information. So to create a new variable, all I need to do is look over here on the left side under the category where it says my blueprint. And in there, there is a section called variables. So we just click on the plus variable button here to create a new variable. And we'll give it a name. We're going to call it launch velocity because, of course, that's what we're plugging it into. Then looking back over on the other side, back in the details, you're going to see that the variable name says launch velocity. And the variable type right now is just set automatically to Boolean. Boolean just means whether or not it's a yes, no variable or if it's a true, false variable. But we're not looking for a true, false variable. We're looking for a variable that can actually define the launch velocity how high it goes up in the z-axis, how far forward it goes in the x-axis, or how side to side it goes in the y-axis. So we're going to change the variable type here to a vector. And you can see that it matches the color to what we're trying to use here. It is yellow, and that is the launch velocity that we're going to be using. It's a yellow launch velocity. So now all I got to do is grab my launch velocity, Back over here on the other side is the launch velocity variable. I just click and drag it over and hover it over the launch velocity here. Move it down a little bit so I can read it more clearly. So now I have launch velocity going in and setting the launch velocity for the launch character. Now you're going to notice that if I look over in the details, all the way down at the details menu here, it says, please compile the blueprint. Because we just created this for the first time, it doesn't actually allow us to set a default number yet. The default number being what it is the first time every time we drag in the launch pad. So we have to click on the compile button. Excellent. And now we see over here that the default value is set to 0, 0, and 0. So to get it identical to what it was before, we're going to change it to 1400 again. And then the last thing that I need to do is right up here, the third item from the top on the details menu says instant editable, editable. In other words, whether or not it's going to be public editable once I actually drag it out into my game world. That's also represented by the little eyelid down here in the blueprint section. When I click on the eyelid, it means that it's going to be visible to the whole world once we actually place our launch pad somewhere out in the game world. You see that's checked here and the eyelid is open there. So let's click compile now and save. Close this window. And now that I have my launch pad here, when I click on this, you can look down in the details menu on the right side. And there is a whole new section here that is called default. And right up on top is launch velocity. Now you might notice before I used the camelback method to label my variables. So again, when I said launch velocity, I did not put a space in there. I just said capital L, capital V for launch velocity. But Unreal actually adds the space in there anyways, just to make it easier to read. Unreal's really cool like that. So anyways, there's my launch velocity, which means now I can actually change this launch pad here to have different launch velocities. So one cool thing we can do is I'm going to press the Alt button. Grab onto the red arrow and drag it back. So I now have two launch pads, one right before the next. So what I wanted to do 
is to have the first one do a small bounce and then the second one do a big bounce. So the second one is set to 1400. The first one I'm going to set to, I don't know, 600. And let's see how this looks. I'm gonna run down the corridor here. Here I come to my launch pads. The first launch pad, I'm gonna hit it. Bounce. Hit the second launch pad. Hey, my guess was right. 600. Nailed it perfectly both times. All right, so that's one cool possibility. Let's try some other possibilities here. Um, one thing, actually, of course, I forgot to mention. I was doing some experiments in the past week just to ref figure out what I wanted to teach you guys. So what you might have noticed is that I switched off the endless runner function. When my runner starts here, he is just standing here. So of course, if you're scratching your head saying, wait a minute, my guy's running all the time. Well, that's because of what we did last week. So again, we can switch that on and off quickly by going into our third person BP here, opening up blueprints and double clicking on third person character. So you might recall that we had disconnected the input axis move forward and instead use the event tick to have it go forward all the time. But because I was doing some experiments and the like, I wanted to make sure that I was actually still able to stop. So what I did was is that I just reconnected the input axis move forward. Remember, we can disconnect existing ones by pressing the Alt button and disconnecting them. So this way, by keeping the event tick and the input axis move forward right next to each other, I can quickly reactivate my runner, endless runner function anytime I want or deactivate it if for some reason I need to do some testing of my game. So I'm just going to leave it deactivated for now while I'm still doing testing. So uh, let's see here. Where shall we put this for now? Our further experiment here will have to go all the way to the end because that's actually where I've actually got the room for it now. So let's just say hypothetically that we go back content here and we look in our blueprints folder there's the launch pad i drag in the launch pad and i want to scale the launch pad up a little bit so it's more of a target to hit and as you can see it still has the default of 1400. now what if i wanted to make someone bounce in different directions every single time so let's drag this out And I want it to make it even bigger. I don't want to make the game too frustrating. So I'm going to make this a big square launch pad here. A good target for people to try and aim for. There you go. A nice big launch pad. So now what I can do is I can then tell it to bounce it to the left. So the left would actually be slightly in the Y direction. We'll just say 1400. No, no, negative 1400. That would be left in the Y direction. Z will still be straight up in the air. So, and then to make sure that our game over, or excuse me, that our starting point is actually close to where we are, so that way we don't have to run all the way down there, I'm going to quickly go back to the front view. No, not the front view, the left view. Here we are. So with the left view, I can see the player start all the way over on this side. So I'm just going to drag this all the way over next to my new launch pad. Here we are. This way I can actually do my testing with my new launch pad. So it launches us up and I'm totally missing it. Okay. So this is why we test. Let's pull this out a little bit more and play again. So, launch forward. Still almost too far. Launch left! There we go. Whoa, that was actually a much further launch left than I thought. Okay. So maybe 1400 is a little bit too powerful, but you get the idea of what we're actually doing here. With this launch pad in the middle there, I can actually now set new directions that it goes in. Now, the last thing that we want, might want to do in this instance is give us an indication as to which way it's going to be launching us. 
So right now, I'm just kind of guessing it, and I memorized it because I typed it in saying, oh yeah, this next one bounces us over to the left. We still have a lot of forward momentum. We might even want to shut down the forward momentum too, actually. All right, so two things we want to do then at this point is we want to give ourselves some sort of a visual cue so we know which way our launch pad is going to be launching us. And then we also want to stop any of the forward momentum. So let's go back into our launch pad again to edit it a little more. And you might remember how I mentioned before the XY override and the Z override. So what the Z override does and the XY override does is that it will then stop any particular momentum that we have. So I was using the Z override for before to make sure that the character's momentum would thrust it forward just from the running that we were doing. Um, <clears throat> and so, uh, yeah, sorry, so I'm confusing myself here. So it was actually the XY override I left unchecked to make sure that my X momentum moving forward would still thrust us forward. But the Z override, I wanted to make sure that if we jumped onto the launch pad, it would still launch us up into the air instead of our momentum going through it and causing it to do a very small and pathetic jump. So to make sure that our um, it will actually launch us properly, we're actually going to turn this on to XY override. Now, likewise, too, here, you're going to see that there are these little red nodes here. We can actually add in a Boolean variable and then set it to be instance editable or publicly visible. So that way we can actually turn on and off the XY override out in the main part. I don't think that necessarily really matters here. Um, I think this is actually going to be the way we're going forward with our game, that we're going to always make sure that they're being launched in at a speed that has nothing to do with the actual character speed. So, um, so let's actually set the X default X to 1400 forward. So that way it launches us forward, no matter what the speed is going to be at any particular time. And of course we want them to go up in the air at any particular time. So let's just quickly test that here. So X, Y override and Z override now. The default is always gonna be 1400 going forward. Now looking back at the first launch pad here, Launches us forward, way too far forward. <laughs> okay, so try that again. Make it 600. So even if I come up now, because I have XY override on, even if I just give it the lightest touch, such as bouncing on it, there we go. it's going to launch me forward by a velocity of 600 forward. Move the pad forward a little bit. Let's try this again. So forward directly, bounce. We bounce to the left. No, we don't bounce to the left. We bounce to the left and forward. What did I do wrong? Oh yes, because our new default includes 1400 to forward. Right, so I need to change the X direction to zero at this point. All right, so bounce forward. It's always going to be the same every time. So this way, you don't have to worry about your players making a mistake by hitting it with the wrong velocity or something. They're always going to be launched at the same velocity every time. Lots of cool possibilities here. So lastly, let's add our visual cue so that way we can always tell which way it's going to be launching. Let's open up our launch pad here. So going to the viewport, just to remind you, when we're on the event graph here, we see these little menus up on top. There's the construction script and the viewport. So in the viewport here, we're going to add a new component by dropping down the add component menu here. And in there, we're gonna look for an arrow. So the arrow is just for your convenience only. It is just for the programmer to use, for the game designer to use. It is not actually visible in the game world. And you can kind of see it here. It's actually overlapping the other red arrow. But right now it is just pointing forward because this arrow doesn't do anything. What we want to do is we want this arrow to be matched with the direction of our launch velocity. Right now our launch velocity is set at 1400. 
but I don't want it to be 1400. Let's make it 600. There we are. So an X direction of 600 and a Z direction of 1400. So it launches us high in the air and sort of forward. That is our default right now. So that is our launch velocity. So this is actually the situation where we use the construction script. The construction script is used whenever a new blueprint or an actor is placed in the world. So our launch pad here is an actor. And we want to make sure that every time we place in a new launch pad in the world, including when we copy it, it's going to run this construction script to see which way the velocity is set at. So to do that, first we grab our launch velocity and drag it in. It's going to ask us if we want to get it or set it. We're going to get it. So now that we have gotten our launch velocity, we need to set it up to rotate our arrow so that way the rotate the arrow is rotated up to face the direction we want. So right now, of course, I could click on the arrow here, switch to the rotation tool, and manually drag it up in the air, and that way the arrow is pointing in a particular direction. But I want it to actually go in the direction that my launch velocity is pointing in. So to do that, we go to our launch velocity here, we drag off a Forward off of our launch velocity here. And we're going to search for rotate. And no, I don't actually want to rotate the vector. Hold on. Get rotate. Rotate. Now I'm forgetting which variable I used. Make rotation from axes. Yes, that's what I'm forgetting. All right. So what you can do then is that you can then provide the rotation a series of axes. So that way you're providing whether or not we're defining the pitch, the roll, and the yaw. In this case, I think we can just get away with just using the forward rotation only. And then it's gonna return a rotation value. So with our construction script, when it is first created, we want to do something to the arrow. So we're gonna go up and drag the arrow in. Pull a cord off of the arrow itself, and we're going to say set relative ro rotation. So relative rotation just means relative to the blueprint that we're working in right now. How is it being rotated? It is being rotated according to the launch velocity. We drag in the construction script, connect it to the set relative rotation, and then we click compile. When we compile, the construction script does a kind of a cool little thing here. It shows us that it is currently checking to make sure that it is updating the information that we have. And so now we will see that my default has set the arrow to point in the direction that we have. And so at this point, I can change the launch velocity to 0x, and now it points straight up in the air. 600x shows it's pointing slightly forward. I can change my Z to zero, and now it's pointing in that direction. So Z would mean that it's pointing straight forward. Y, of course, would make it rotate slightly over to the side, and so on. So we can even include in our construction script a way to change its scale so it gets bigger as the larger as our uh, velocity goes and so on and so on. I think this is actually good enough for our purposes at least. Let me undo this a few times by pressing Control Z. So now at least this is giving us a very handy arrow showing us which way our launch pad is pointing. So compile and save that. And now we can go back here and take a look at our launch pad. And now we see that the arrow is pointing straight forward. Very handy. Now we can see that this launch pad is pointing off to the side. Excellent. 
Now, of course, I kept on changing the default values. So again, it looks like my launch velocity has been set to have an X value of 600. I'm changing that back to zero. There we go. Now my arrow is pointing straight off to the side. I know which way this launch pad is launching. So let's make a copy of it. We'll do this a few more times. Give you an idea of how much fun we can have with this. So it launches off a little bit to the side and then maybe it launches us backwards just for fun and giggles. Over to the side one more time. And then forward again. Of course, I'm going to have to totally be guessing about the numbers here, but let's see here. If we had it go forward. Oh, yeah, we had to go left by 600. Now we want it to go backwards by 600. So backwards by 600. And the Y at this point will be zero. The Z is still 1400 in the air. We'll keep the Z the same every single time. Then it goes over to the left again. That's fine. We'll leave that the same. Now this one, we're going to want it to go forward by 600. So we're taking 600 in the X. The Y will be zero this time because it's not going left. And Z is still the same. Let's give this a try. All right. So we come down here. We bounce off of this one. Bounce. We land on this one. Nice. I still have to aim it a little bit. Oh. Okay. <laughs> so let's see here. How do we fix that? Move this a little bit further over. Move that a little bit further over. It's back. Now, for those of you who might be familiar with the video game Undertale, there is a notorious section in Hotland where you come across a series of platforms that are similar to this, where it just keeps on bouncing around along in a puzzle and you have to figure out how to get yourself to bounce correctly so you actually get to the end of the particular scene. And for me, it left me puzzled for a long time because I kept on bouncing in the wrong places. But this totally reminds me of that. So we bounce forward, left, and I still miss it. <laughs> okay, so this is going to require some more testing and the like. How are we doing on time here? All right. Don't want to bore you guys too much. We need to add explosions and everything to our game, of course, when we have a game over event. So let me just make a few more adjustments here. Maybe we're actually just bouncing too high in the air. Let's try 1000 instead. All right, so then this goes over there by 600,000. And this one will be 1000. And of course, if I really wanted to, I could actually do all the math for the trajectories and everything to figure out how to properly place them all along, but I don't have time to be doing all that math. So instead, we'll just rely on kind of guessing it every single time. We go left, then we go backwards, then we go right, here we go. Then we go forwards. Awesome. So you can keep on doing that for a long time. You can do all sorts of funny things with platforms like that now that we got some cool launch pads. And I'm falling far, far away from my world. Bye-bye, world. Okay. So, yes, that is how we use variables in a very handy way to make some changes to our launch pads. We also added in the arrows to it. And you can imagine that there's all sorts of cool possibilities for arrows in other instances too. Remember, the arrows are there for you as the game designer's benefit to remind yourself how you set up your actors. So now I've got all these handy arrows pointing, letting me know which way they bounce and at what time. We can even go back here to our rotating spinners here and we can even add in an arrow to them as well. So for example, if I go into the spinner, I go to the viewport again, I add component and I add an arrow. This arrow is actually a little bit easier. We don't necessarily have to create it using the construction script because it's just going to be pointing the direction that it's supposed to be rotating at any given time.
Right, that's sort of the direction it's going in, but actually what we need to do is move it to the far end of this. As I, I did rotate it a full 90 degrees, then I ended up placing it wrong. So hold on, let's try and put that back in. All right, so the arrow. So I added the arrow here. Rotate it. I'm just going to type it over here in the details menu. That'll give me a guaranteed results. Okay, and then drag it along the green axis here out to the far end. There we are. And this way, the arrow is letting me know which way it is rotating. Now, if I wanted to, I could even set it up so that way it rotates instead of clockwise, it can rotate counterclockwise, and we can make those changes in the rotating movement. We could even add new variables that control when and how it is going forwards or backwards, how fast it is going, and then you can even still set in a reminder to yourself using the construction script as to which way the arrow is pointing. All right, so we'll compile and save that. We are at the halfway mark right now, so I just wanted to say hello again if you're just joining us. My name is Doug Teppi, I'm with Tinker and Create, and this is our digital game design class, week six. Today we have just gone over adding variables to our uh, blueprints as a way to get better control over how we use them, and lots of cool possibilities with that there. What I'm gonna do for the rest of the class here is we're gonna see if we can get our game over event to work a little bit cooler. We're gonna add in a explosion sound effect and have it give us better control over when and how we actually have a game over event occurring. So let's get into this. We are gonna take a look here again at our game over event here from what we used before. This is the quick and easy way that I do my game over event. Where if I just want to do it quickly, I just say check to make sure we overlap. If we overlap and we make sure that it is the third person character, we pop up the message that says game over. We wait two seconds and then we open the level, level one again. Now, as I mentioned earlier, opening the level does have some drawbacks, though, because it means that timers and things will all start over again. And if we want to make sure that the timers aren't starting over again, because maybe the timers are going to are going to be our um, our high score list, for example, then we want to make sure that the timers are constantly running the whole time. We don't want to be opening a level the whole time. So we're actually going to take our game over box here. We're going to change this a little bit, actually. Instead, we're going to get rid of it, adding in the viewport, the HUD, and everything like that. We're just going to take this whole thing here, press delete. It's gone now. We're going to leave in the cast a third person character. And now what we're going to say is add third as the third person character. We're dragging off a chord here, and we're going to type in destroy, destroy, if I can spell it right, actor. So we are destroying the actor when it touches it. Now you might think, oh yeah, <laughs> destroy, this is great, this is what we should have been doing all along. Well, of course, in gameplay terms, when we say destroy, it just means remove it from the game world. So let's click play here, and I'm going to demonstrate what I'm talking about, all right? So right now, when I actually go into my game, you just saw briefly in the upper left-hand corner here, it said press Shift F1 to get mouse control. So now that I got the mouse control again, I'm gonna look over here at the world outliner. And in the world outliner, you're gonna see that there's a series of things here, all in kind of a pale yellow color. These are all things that only appear once the game actually starts getting played, including, of course, my third person character here. There's the third person game mode, which controls how the player is run. And of course, if you have a multiplayer game, it's gonna be the game mode that keeps track of all the different players. And then there's a the third person character itself. So keep an eye on the third person character in our world outliner, okay? I'm gonna go back into the viewport here, and I'm gonna run down here and step onto the lava. He disappears, and now you can see over in the world outliner, it has been completely removed from the game world. 
doesn't even exist anymore. I cannot control it anymore. No game over message, everything just froze up. So this is sort of a fashion of doing a game over event. Of course, you still want to have some sort of a user interface or some way of letting the player know that they screwed up and they're gonna to have to start over again. Plus we wanna have it actually start the game over again. So the way we do that then is with the game mode. To edit the game mode, we have to open up our blueprints here. Likewise, as before, I think they actually do store it inside the third person blue, uh, the third person BP folder, and then in the blueprints folder, and you'll see it listed here as third person game mode. Or you can also drop down this menu up on top where it says project settings, game mode, edit, third person game mode. And we go in here and we will see now the game mode where it sets all the extra definitions for the game, such as what uh, what character we're using. You'll see down here saying the uh, the default pawn class is the third person character. So of course that's just how it decides how everything starts. But we want to actually start doing something more than just that. We want to actually go and check to see whether or not the game over has even occurred. So we're going to open the full blueprint editor here. We're going to make our game mode to be more than just a place where it stores information as to how the game is run. We're going to be doing things with the game mode now. It's going to be keeping track of things. So we go in to edit our game mode, and it's going to give us a blank blueprint. So first things first, we're going to add a new begin play. So at the beginning of play, when the level is first loaded, it's going to do this. The first thing we want to do is to get our third person character. We do that by casting. We're gonna say cast to third person character. Now you recall, as I mentioned with variables, this is actually a special variable. It's being cast into the third person character, meaning of course that it is a variable that has all the information that we need about the third person character in it. Then the object has to be declared here. So we have to say which character it is. So we're gonna say get character. No, not get character, it's get player. Here we are, get player character. So whichever get player character is assigned to player zero. You might recall that player zero, of course, is the first player. It's gonna be put into the third person character here. And then with the third person character here, now we will go off and we need to say, here we are, bind event to on destroyed. So the character and the pawn and actually most actors in uh, Unreal, all have a special event that is called on destroyed. And its job is to basically wait and listen to see if a particular actor was destroyed. And then if so, then it waits to see if we're gonna do something. It's gonna record all the information about the, the uh, actor about it before it was destroyed so we can actually use it later. So this is kind of handy. With on destroyed now, we can actually create a new event here that is associated with our third person character. So we are listening for when the third person character is destroyed, we've created a new event. And that's what this little red box is down here. By dragging off this new event, we're gonna create a custom event. And we're not gonna bother naming it. Custom event zero is perfectly fine. So with custom event zero, we are saying this is what we're going to do when the character is destroyed. First thing we want to do is we want to add the delay that we had before. So with the delay of say, I don't know, 2.5 seconds, we wait for 2.5 seconds before we do the next thing. The next thing then is, is that we're going to want to respawn our character back at the beginning again. So to respawn it back at the beginning, of course, we need to actually figure out where the beginning even was. 
We're gonna do that by creating a spawn transform variable. So a transform is a kind of variable that keeps track of size, rotation, and location of whatever it is that you're looking for. So what we're gonna do is once the game actually starts, we're gonna record where this starting point was, and then we're gonna put it in here. So to do that, we need to add a variable here, and it's gonna be called spawn transform. We change the variable type to transform. Transform is marked by this orange marker here. We drag it into our blueprint and say get spawn transform. Now Unreal actually has made this kind of easy. If you press and hold the control button while you drag something in, it automatically means get every single time. So we're getting the information in the spawn transform. And I think the alt button will always give you the set if we're changing the value of our spawn transform. We'll use set. So pressing control and dragging in the spawn transform. Then with our spawn transform, we then need to drag off of our completed here. We're gonna say spawn actor. Here we are. Spawn actor from class. So to define which particular class we're going to use, class is actually just a fancy way of referring to the blueprints. Now in computer programming terms, a class is actually a whole series of functions that all work together. And that's actually what our blueprints are. The whole series of functions that work together to create our third person character. So we're gonna say third person character. So here we are, we are spawning the third person character. Where are we spawning it? At the transform that we defined at the beginning of the game. Okay, so this is great. This means it's gonna actually pop our little Unreal robot back at the beginning of the game again. The only thing that's missing at this point then is that we actually need to possess the third person character. In other words, the controller needs to actually control the pawn, needs to control the character. So we drag off another chord here. We type in possess, and it's not context sensitive, so we'll actually have to click off this so it actually looks outside. So we want to possess something in particular. What is it we're possessing? We want to possess our newly created third person character. We could have actually done that by dragging off the blue line here with context sensitive on, then when I type in P-O-S-S, all right, famous last words. I guess it doesn't actually bring it up from that one either. Oh, I know where it brings it up. We need to actually find which controller is player one. So we need to say get player controller. All right, now we drag off of the controller, find out which controller is player one, and we say possess. There's possess. So the context menu will actually listen for something that is actually relevant to what we're looking for. The player controller possesses things. What does it possess? It says in pawn. So remember, our characters are pawns, so we want to be possessing our new character that we just created. All right, so to make sure I actually did this correctly, Oops, there is one more thing I forgot about actually, is that we actually, now that we have created this new third person character, we need to make sure that it actually applies all the new information of that new third person character with the binding event to it. Otherwise, we're only gonna be able to have a game over event once and then it's gonna forget that we did this every time. So with that new blueprint, with that new um, third person character that we spawned, we actually have to go back and redo everything from event begin play. So we're gonna make a new custom event up here. Say add a custom event. And up with this custom event here, this time I'm actually gonna name it, I'm gonna call it spawn character. And then I'm gonna connect this into the third person character here. Basically just meaning that either at the beginning of the play or when it was destroyed, we're gonna spawn the character again. 
So to run the spawn character again after the possession has occurred here, we just type in spawn character. There it is. That's the new one that I just created. So we say compile and save. Now the only thing left that we need to do is to make sure that we actually record where the third person character was when the game starts. So by pressing play here, I go back to the starting location. So here's my starting location. But the game's not actually going to know where that is necessarily unless we tell it. So the easiest way that I figured out how to do that is to go into the third person character blueprint here. Go up to the top where we say event begin play. You recall that we actually created the HUD and added it here. All we need to do then at this point is we need to reach inside our game mode. We're going to say get game mode. And as before, to actually reach inside it, we need to cast it. So we're going to say cast to third person game mode. Because, of course, there could be several different kind of game modes. We need to make sure that we're actually specifying which one. So in this case, it is the third person game mode. We connect this as the third person game mode. Now we just need to refer to the spawn transform. So we're getting the spawn transform. Actually, no, this is one of those situations where we set. We're setting the spawn transform. Here we are. So we're setting the spawn transform with the actual transform of our third person character right now. So we're going to say get transform of the actor. So the actor, of course, in this instance is the third person character. So it says get actor transform. Which actor are we talking about? We're talking about herself, the third person. Connect that in. So now what it's doing is that it is saving the variable of our spawn transform into the third person game mode at the beginning of the play. So that means we are recording where the starting point is. So that way we can go back there every time we have a game over event. Now I sure hope I did this right. Let's experiment. I'm going to press play. I'm going to run right over here. We're going to step on the lava. Actor is destroyed, and two seconds later, we pop back to the beginning again. Awesome. Now this is kind of handy, because now this just means that anytime the character is destroyed, we will have our game over event occur automatically every single time. This means that we can actually start using different actors for game over events. We don't necessarily have to use that other game over actor. We can actually have it so when certain things hit it, for example, it's destroyed. All right, but I did promise we were going to add something kind of fun and cool here, right? We need to have an explosion effect here, right? This is no fun without the explosion effect, right? Every time I run in there, he just disappears. Let's have him blow up. All right. So to have him blow up, we go back into the third person game mode. And we look back here to our custom events. So remember, when we click on bind event to on destroyed, it runs the custom event and it does the delay. But let's actually stick something in between here. The character's already been destroyed, so it is already gone from the game world. It is missing, so we have a nice little empty space here where we can stick in some fun mischief. So what we want to do then is, is that we're going to drag off of a new chord here in between them, and we're going to spawn an actor again. So spawn actor from class. Remember, a class is just a computer programming term for a series of functions that all work together. In this case, though, in Unreal, a class just means another blueprint. So which class are we looking for? We're looking for one of those combined blueprints that I talked about last week, where it combines a special effect and, along with a sound effect. Now you can see spawn actor blueprint effect explosion. Now we need to actually tell it where to place that. Because right now it's not going to know where to place that. If I compile this right now, it throws an error message and it says something's missing. And the reason is because it's expecting a spawn transform. It doesn't know where to place my explosion. 
So this is where the handy thing comes in from before. Even though my character has been destroyed, it still has recorded where it last was in this special variable right here called the destroyed actor. So we can pull a string off of this destroyed actor here and say, uh, we want to get the world location. For some reason it's not visible here. Here we are, get world location. All right, it's kind of finicky because it doesn't like the context that I'm using. So again, when you're trying to find something and you can't find it, it's probably because your context sensitive box is selected here. So what it's done here is that it is checking in the destroyed actor for something that might have a world location. It's just assuming I want the top root component. So you might recall whenever we create a new blueprint, it refers to the very bottom end of all the different components we add as the root. So we're just trying to get the world location from the root. With that, it gives us this yellow variable here. We can't actually place that into spawn transform by itself because one is orange, the other is yellow. So you see what it's doing here is it's actually automatically converting a location value, which is a vector, and it's yellow into a transform value, which is orange. So you might remember again, transform is referring to also not just the location, but the rotation and the scale. So by putting this in and having it automatically convert, the rotation is gonna be zero and the scale is gonna be one. It's not gonna be scaled at all. It's not gonna be rotated at all. That's fine because really all I want to do is just place in the explosion in the location where our game character last was. So this should be good enough at this point. We're going to say compile gives me the checkbox. Excellent. I gave it a 2.5 second delay, which I noticed is about the amount of time it takes for the explosion effect to occur. Let's click save. Now we can run down to the end of here, step onto the lava. Boom. Two seconds are up. We go back to the beginning again. Boom. I could do this all day. This is too much fun. And that is just such a cool special effect too. So remember, these special effects are made using the particle emitter. So if you look closely at the explosion here, you'll see that some of the sparks from the explosion will actually bounce off the walls. Particle emitters are very handy in that regard. They actually check to see if there's things that there's bounceable and then have it actually affect how it occurs. There's also a particle emitter for the smoke. So we have this nice smoke effect that appears on there. And of course, because it is a combined blueprint of both this particle emitter and the sound effect, we get that very satisfying explosion sound. And it starts us all over again. So this is kind of cool because now we actually have a way of letting people know that the game is over without even having it pop up with a message. It's pretty obvious the game is over at this point. Okay, so I am looking at the time here and we've got eight minutes left. I'm gonna talk about what I want to do for the rest of the class today. I don't know if I'm gonna have time, but we'll try and do it so we can actually add in the timer because we wanna keep track of the time because people are gonna be bragging about how fast they can complete the game. And if they lose too many times, if the game over occurs too many times, it's gonna take them longer. So we want to include a timer in the game. And then for next week, uh, if you were just totally overwhelmed with all of this discussion about uh, computer science and computer programming, next week I'm going to be spending a little more time focusing on just actually decorating the world and filling it out more and making it into a very cool place. Because so far we don't really have that. And so for those of you who might be more artistically inclined, next week is definitely going to be the week for you. We're going to add in a lot more cool artwork and stuff. But for now, let's just see if we can add in the timer for the game. So to add the timer in again, we're gonna go back to our main content folder here. 
We're gonna look down at the bottom to our blueprints folder. No, not the blueprints folder. The UMG, the Unreal Motion Graphics, which is what we use to create our HUD. And you remember, of course, we placed in before a message that said you lose. So every single time the HUD appeared on the screen, it would just say you lose. But instead of it saying you lose, let's have a different message this time. So we're gonna delete the you lose. We're going to add in a horizontal bar. So a horizontal bar in terms of user interface design means that it will allow us to put two different things next to each other horizontally, side by side. So that way I can actually have a message saying time and then next to it the amount of time that has actually passed since the game started. So to do that, we need to go down here to the menu that says panel. We're gonna be looking for a horizontal box. Click and drag in the horizontal box and we'll place it in the upper right-hand corner. Now I wanna make sure it's always some distance off from the upper right-hand corner here. So I need to switch my anchor over to the top right-hand corner. And now I can set this so that way it's always at a position of negative 200 and a Y position of 80. Yeah, that sounds good enough. It's size X will be 200, maybe. Let's make this negative 300. There we go. Uh, will be 80, and yeah, that's pretty much the right size that we want. So now we go up here to our text, drag the text in. Make sure your text block is inside your horizontal box now. This text box, we're gonna change its text over here in the details menu to time with a colon. And then we're gonna drag in another text and put it right next to the first. And this is gonna be where our numbers come from. I'll just say seconds for now. This is just a holder because this is actually gonna be pulling information from the game to find out how much time has occurred since the game started. To do that, we need to actually put in a new function into our text here. You do that by binding a function to the text. And you'll see right next to the text here, there is a little drop down menu that says bind. We click on create binding. Now it takes us over to the graph for our, uh, for our HUD. And then what it does is that it says get text zero and then it returns something. What is it gonna return? Well, we want it to return the actual time. So to get the time, we first need to find we need to find the elapsed time from the game. Hold on. I'm blanking on what it was. That wasn't the right one, actually. Oh, that's what it was. Yep, there it is. Get game time, finally. So, from the start of the game, from the moment that we opened our new level, it's gonna be keeping track in seconds as to how much time has passed. So we're practically out of time here. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to stuff this directly into the return node here. So what it does is, again, I have it exporting a number. It's a floating point number, meaning it has a decibel point in the middle of it. And it's recording the number of seconds, including milliseconds, I think, too. It needs to change that into something that can actually be read into text. So it starts out as a number, but it needs to be text, so that way it can appear in our event graph, I mean, excuse me, in our HUD. So now when we go back here, you're gonna see that the second one that we added here now actually says here, get text zero, meaning it's gonna run that function. And what that function is doing is that it is checking to see what the game time is in seconds. 
We'll try and see if we can make this appear more elegant next week so it actually has minutes and seconds. But for now, let's click Compile, Save. We need to go back and make sure that this will appear all the time on our third person character. Because remember what it was doing before, it was only appearing whenever we had a game over event. So to have it appear all the time, we need to go back to our third person character. And let's see here, this is getting to be a little bit of a mess, but where it says create HUD widget, right after that, we then saved it as HUD, referring to the widget. So then we can just drag off of one off the end here, or we can also grab our HUD here by pressing control, dragging it in. And we want to add to viewport. Our widget is added to the viewport with this extra one that we're just adding on to the end here. Compile and save. Let's see if this actually worked. There it is, up in the upper corner now. We see seconds ticking by, five seconds, six seconds. Now this, of course, is being recorded regardless of whether or not the game over event has occurred. So I come up here, game over, starts us over again. It is still at 19 seconds. Still canting up. So remember, as I mentioned before, that number would have actually gone back to zero if we opened the level again. But because we're not opening the level again, we're not beginning play again, it's still counting how long the game has occurred in seconds. This is a great way for us to keep track of the high scores for the game. Because of course, the people who didn't do very well are gonna have higher numbers. The people who did very well are gonna have lower numbers. Lots of cool possibilities there. So. For next week, um, what we are going to do is we are going to add in the more artistic things. Uh, for those of you who are more artistically minded, we're going to try and decorate the world a little bit more. We're going to add in some more 3D models. We're going to see if we can add in some music. Uh, we're also just going to make it so that way the time showed in the upper corner will actually show minutes and seconds instead of just seconds alone. Um, and anything else that maybe you'd like to try and see that we can cover next week, I'll see if I can cover it. And um, so I hope you guys had a great time. Again, my name is Doug Teppi, and I'm with Tinker and Create. This is Class 5 of Digital Game Design. As always, of course, make sure you save your projects. Uh, it does have an automatic save function in it, but you want to make sure that you also save your blueprints and everything as well. So just taking a quick peek back here again at our... Uh, Unreal Editor here, there is the Save All button down here, which will save for all your uh, new blueprints that you created, as well as Save Current up here, which saves your level. They don't necessarily always get saved on time, so click those frequently to save your progress. And uh, yes, yeah, so next week, artwork, music, funny sound effects. Oh yeah, I totally forgot the funny sound effects. You know, the launch pads need to have a Boeing sound effect. All right, so make sure you come back next week for the fun Boeing sound effect. I hope you guys had fun, and we'll see you then.